Folks, welcome back to So Bad It's Good, presented by Betches Media. Today, this is just a gift to me and to all of us. Uh, he was nice enough to come on so I could go have a nice vacation in Europe. We were supposed to do this earlier in the week, but uh, a sinus infection took me down. So uh, pardon me for my voice. But our guest, I just have to tell him, and I told you guys a week and a half ago, is that I do my annual listen of David Sedaris books, and I got through with them way too quick this year. So I went back and I re-listened to uh, two fabulous books, How Do I Unremember This and The Jolliest Bunch. And I got to tell you, it's a nice little sweet spot. It's that like if you like I, I was like, oh, sorry, David, like this is I, I'm really yeah. enjoying this. this is going to be added to my annual listen to. And I got to tell you, especially well, how do I unremember this really kind of moved me in a different way than it did the first time. But regardless, you know him from his podcast, Everything Iconic. And now we have to congratulate him as a spokesperson for one of his dream brands, Home Goods. Are you kidding me? He's actually now also has his own Puppet Muppet character, the one, the only, Danny Pellegrino. Danny, welcome back. I, I mean, I love you, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me. It also makes it seem like the Muppet or Jim Henson like personally made a Muppet for I me. Know. And that's not true. I did order it myself. <laughs> but still, it's it's still in that realm of like, I know how much you appreciate the Muppets. So it's like, that's one of the brilliant things that you do is that I think you find the things that you grew up loving and you find a way to introduce it to the pop culture that we all love and you love. And it's such a nice, like I was watching that. I was like, oh, this is just brilliant because it celebrates what you love. But you're also having this person talk about Vanderpump Rules in the Valley. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, and you know, uh, doing a podcast, it, there's so much pressure, even um, whether it be people that you work with or or representatives or something that uh, there's so much pressure to add video to the podcast. And when I'm doing my recap, so an interview is a different thing. Like those are kind of easier for me to handle with the video aspect of it, especially if they're on Zoom, it's much easier to record and pop yeah. the background kind of thing. Um, but when I'm just doing the recaps of Vanderpump Rules or some of the other shows, people would say, why don't you post video of it? And the truth is I record alone in my office. And I, I think that kind of is the intimacy of it, which you yeah. can probably relate to. Uh, and so I think having a camera on me when I went in that intimate space it just doesn't work as much. I feel like I'd be a little more guarded or the oh. times that I have tried to do it where I'm alone <laughs> and videoing myself. There's just a, a self-consciousness to it. And so I felt like that was a good uh, a good balance, a good way to incorporate some of the uh, audio from the podcast in a video form for social media. It totally it will, I can I'll, handle. I'll, vid like, I'll video just because of the way it captures like the solo ones I do, but people will complain if we put it out of like, you're not looking at the camera. I'm like, I don't, I'm not even looking at myself. Like I am looking down or I'm looking at notes that I make. And the more that I do look at myself, the more it would take me out of doing idiotic things that I say, which is like part of the magic for me is getting to a point mm -hmm. where I make myself laugh in a certain way. Right. And we're, I mean, trying to take away all of the artifice, I think is what yeah. makes the show so intimate. And so yeah, and of course I love the Muppets and Puppets, but don't you feel like there is this like weird pressure about putting up video? And I don't even know that it's necessarily a good thing. I might have talked to talked to Kate Casey about this, but it's like I don't know that it really helps because a lot of the times when I see video on social media, it just makes me think, oh, I don't need to listen to the podcast. And then also, yeah. I mean, you know how ad sales work and stuff. It's like I, I if the you make more money on the audio podcast feed. Sorry, I'm getting in the weeds. A no, little no, bit this is the people. Scenes should know this but you do make more money doing it in audio ads and so i don't really understand why you would want to take some of the audience away and maybe direct them to something like youtube which you can also make money on but you're not gonna you know i don't yeah pe I don't and know people also people thank youtube you make this like uh, oh well i'm watching commercials on youtube trust me you, you're not it's not that it's not like money that you could actually survive on. And I'm not complaining about that, but it is funny is that I got into this and I have a very, ro uh, I romanticize the podcast format. I romanticize listening to something and not viewing it because I think, especially like us and a lot of the audience, we, I watch things nonstop with my eyes. I, I digest so many shows now more than I ever have in my life. And sometimes it does take the magic away when I just want to hear a voice in my ears. That's why I was just like re-listening to your audiobooks. There is something magical about sharing an experience where I can shut my eyes and picture it myself and relate it to my own thing. And I think sometimes with the video, we're told that this is the way uh -huh. that the world works. This is the way the world is going. And I'm like, those are talk shows. Those are video talk shows, which I want Danny to do as well. But like, let podcasting be podcasting. Don't destroy the industry. And do you, do you sometimes wish that we could think of a different name for podcast? Because now even on Bravo shows, it's almost made fun of, of like, 
well, they did a podcast and it's podcasting wars. Do you sometimes get like feel that way? Yeah, definitely. And and especially um, in sort of the sphere where in the Bravo or reality TV sphere, there are so many, uh, so many. And it feels almost like now we're also competing with cast members doing the I same know. thing, you know, because I think now we're seeing the cast members, there's this <laughs> new thing where they're recapping the shows. And so, of course, two T's, I think, w was one of the first to really start doing that and brilliant, by the way. But uh, it is interesting dynamic because it's like we were kind of Com not competing. They were like a, a different thing. The people who did it interviewed because they would interview other cast members and they would be a cast member. So they were getting a different perspective and doing it a little different. But now it's like the cast members. Oh, it's the rise. It's yeah. the rise of Vanderpump Rules podcast. The rise of the, I mean, the fact that like we're in the same breath now sometimes as Jax and Brittany, not because of what they did on television, but what they do in the podcasting genre cracks me up. And like, you know, it's like, I, I, I would love like I'll sit here and do this podcast and then I'll sit and edit it and I'll mess around with it. Jax isn't taking the raw audio and editing things. No, out. no, no. And that's the other frustrating. Okay. People are probably going to, because we're just talking. No, about they love it. Stuff. I swear to God, they love but it. I, I also find it, uh, it is, it is tough when everyone thinks we're all working with sort of the same in the same sandbox. And it's yeah. true. We're not <laughs> like I am sitting recording and editing and stuff. And I even get frustrated when people complain about ads or something like that. It's like, well, how do you expect us to do this? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like <laughs> this I mean, ad cut in at the wrong time. I'm like, I swear to God, like, I, I'll, and also, and the other thing too, yeah, and I know we're I not, say I'm this. not, we're not, uh, I heart. We're not. No, that's, it's, it's like, well, I sat down with Mr. Uh, Mr. Betches and, and I was kind of like, they act like it's like this and it is a team effort to a degree, but the same thing, it's like, also there's like a 15 second, like skip button that you could just like hit. I'm not, I'm not telling people to do that, but you know, it is <laughs> funny that it, yeah. it's just so funny. Cause I'm like, that's why I do, I'll do, I'll, I'm, I'm insane. I'll do like two and a half hour podcast because Part of that is, okay, if you have to listen to six hours of commercial, I want to give you as much as I possibly can. And it's ended up like making me sick at times, my idiotic fault, but I do like, I want to give you as much as possible, but it is funny. Those people will still be out there going, heard uh, seven minutes of commercials today. Didn't I like know, it. Didn't I know. like it. I know. I had to uh, scale back. I mean, I've been doing this seven years and I feel like I recently had to let go of all those voices and noises because yeah, you know, I would hear people say like, oh, his heart's not in it or something. And I'm like, <laughs> because you don't, because you maybe you aren't recapping a certain show or, or something. And I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, if you guys knew how much effort I'm putting into this and, and creatively, sometimes it's frustrating when lately I've been feeling more creatively fulfilled than ever because I scaled back a little bit. And, but then some people might take that as like a foot I think out we're the coming. door or something. I'm like, no, I love it. I, yeah, I think I'm coming to a point where I, I need to start scaling back and I'm at a place, but I think, you know, I'm older. I was trying to run so fast, so hard just to even like be a part of this industry. Like Build I always said, like, I, I, well, I never want to be the head of anything. I, I just want to be invited to the table. And like, it is so exciting for me to work with you or watch what crap ends or Kate Casey or Lara or all of like these great people that I've, I've looked up to all this time. But sometimes, yeah, there's a deep insecurity that always runs in me. And I was, you know, listen, re-listening to your book and, you know, you had this great chapter that really rang true. And I think we've talked about this before about mental health, but even quieting down the voices, the outside voices, does that still sometimes get you down? Because it, this year, like it's been the worst year of my life for so many reasons, but I've had so many outside voices where it really has rocked me in certain ways. How do you stay true? And I know this might sound silly, but how do you stay true to an artistic vision? How do you still get inspired? Well, I just, I, I try to always get back to that voice in my head of like, what do I like? Like, even you talked about that puppet, that stupid puppet I have, you know, like I, that's me. Like that, that is what I like. And so I understand a lot of people who are listening to a Vanderpump Rules recap are like, what the fuck is this guy doing with the puppet on his social media? <laughs> Whatever. Like I, I get that, but that's what makes that that's what people could come to the show for me. And that's what it is. Uh, and I understand and get people who might not like that, but I've, I've tried to just shut off all that stuff as much as I can. Obviously it still seeps in, but I don't, I don't read reviews of anything I do. Cause I, that'll spiral me, you know? And so, yeah, I'll never yeah that's the thing. It really, I mean, there. it gets, it, it gets to you. Like, I mean, I, I did at this, I, I was sick all week, but I still managed to do a Vanderpump recap. And then afterwards I found out the Wi-Fi was tricky. So it was like cutting out little pieces of like audio. And I was like furious with myself. There's nothing I could do. 
I, the first thing I opened, the first DM in the morning I opened is like, I love you, but, and then it went on and I was like, I'm going to think about this oh, all day. There's you. nothing I, I could have done. I'm so sorry. But like that shit will eat at me. Cause I'm yeah, like, I already, I I'll beat myself up harder than any, anybody else will beat me up. You know? Yep. Uh, okay. Especially sorry. if you're a self-aware person, like we are, I think, you know it, you know the complaint before somebody's going to complain about it. Exactly. Um, exactly. And it's like, so I've already been agonizing over if I had an audio issue in my head, I've been agonizing about it since I released the episode because I know it was there or, or sometimes I'll agonize. I'll be like, wait, I think I might've said that in another episode. And then I said it again. And how many times did I say it? And because you're editing, you're like, am I just repeating things? Like, I don't know if you know, whatever. Yeah. So you get in your head about that. But I do think it's important to stay away from all like any sort of reviews and stuff because people will also let you know their opinions. They'll find a way to get you their opinions. So I don't need to go searching it out because I know that people will comment on something uh, that uh, they'll let me know their opinion on something or they'll they'll send in a DM or sometimes people will somehow find my email and get it to me that way. So I don't need to search it out because I know it's going to get to me. Oh, yeah. The complaints regardless <laughs> parasocial relationships are amazing i mean they're great sometimes but it's really interesting okay so the other thing about danny that i always and i think this is the magic of mr pellegrino is i'll be sitting there as a relatively straight dude uh that likes all of this stuff but grew up loving pop culture in a small town and everything you know it's like not just the it's not just reality shows with you which i love like you know we both have a deep appreciation of even like siskel and ebert like I, I was reading that biography. I don't know if you read the Siskel and Ebert biography that came out in the last couple of years. I haven't watched. I haven't read it. The new. Oh, it's, it's a newer one, though. I yeah, I it's a newer about. one. But you'll sometimes, I think, post Siskel and Ebert reviews, and it'll make me go down a rabbit hole. And that was the magic of pop culture for me. Of like, that was one of the stations because we didn't have cable, but we would get at the movies and watching these two men fight about movies, and it was so glamorous to me like just to, yeah. to, to and to, to have these people talk respectably about an art form like movies that sometimes even at that time in the 80s and 90s would still get shit on and i think it's interesting you're bringing that same same kind of uh glory and trained eye to reality shows now is that part of like you know growing up loving all of pop culture and then trying to put those kind of put those ways of working into reality and things that you like I don't know if I thought about it in those terms, but certainly I think, yeah, looking back, I, I always loved pop culture and was obsessed with all uh, movies and television. And it, and it did seem, I was raised in Ohio and it seemed like just a, such a world far away from mine that I glamorized it in my head as like this fantasy land uh, of movies. And so, yeah, I, I always did take that stuff seriously. And I am a big fan of anyone. I was just talking to Matt, my a boyfriend about this like i'm a big fan of anyone who's like just obsessed with something as long as it's like a healthy obsession obviously but um i love when somebody has like a weird pop culture obsession like do you you know we're yeah. talking we are yeah. sort of obsessed with the bravo universe and i i love that we can be obsessed with this weird reality tv thing but i love when i meet someone who's obsessed with i don't know pokemon and they're an adult or i yes like people shit on disney adults and i get that that aspect but i also just kind of love that it's like yeah they love these animated things <laughs> no like, i, I, just I, love I when people yes have anything with... exactly i don't even if it's something i can't understand or personally don't like i celebrate people loving something like that's the most exciting thing in the world because that gives you energy and i like it was uh in your book the, the, the story about uh being obsessed with renee zellweger's performance in the judy garland film and you were out to the work dinner for your boyfriend and you just were looking for the like moment that you could jump in and save a conversation by bringing up Judy Garland and Renee Zellweger, you were trying to find that angle. And I was like, those little detours, those little pockets of like little things that you get obsessed with. That's the best part and the, the best okay. part of loving okay. all of this stuff. Okay. Stop right here. We have to just discuss something. So you just said that story about me being at a dinner table with my boyfriend and his boss and some coworkers, whatever. And I so badly wanted to talk about the movie Judy because I had just seen it, became obsessed with it. And that's how my brain works. And just probably five <laughs> minutes ago, as we we're talking about this podcast, I, I you had said something like 90s about 90s pop culture. And in my head, this is the sick thing and how it's all circular. In my head, I was I had seen the movie Bicentennial Man last night. Ah, Robin Williams, which is a crazy fucking movie. Yes, you finally I've saw never seen it. I had never seen it. Don't ask. I, I just had watched it. But anyway, so as you were saying, '90s pop culture you're obsessed with. I in my head was thinking, oh, I should bring up Bicentennial Man. 
<laughs> so I feel like literally I'm doing that same thing you just brought up from the book. Wait, but I'm what possessed you to <laughs> what possessed you to finally watch after 26 years Bicentennial Man? Okay, I just never seen it, and I had I saw this list uh, a couple weeks ago about like you know movies that uh, talked about AI uh, in the past or something like that. It was like they talked about the future, yeah, and it was on there alongside movies like Her and Ex Machina and all those like <laughs> you know. Great movies. Really respected movies. So, so I had uh, read yeah. that, and it, so it was sort of in my head. I remember re looking for it on streaming. It was not available on streaming. Um, and then I just sort of forgot about it. And then I watched Rosie O'Donnell uploads episodes, full episodes of her old show on her YouTube channel. So that's kind of my wind down time. I watch that. When she uploads a new episode, I'll sit and watch the whole thing. And Robin Williams was on the episode that she had just uploaded promoting about Bicentennial Man. And so I was like, oh, I have to see this. So then I I literally had to pay for it, which is disgusting. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> disgusting that I had to pay for it, but like kind of disgusting. I love that, that 20th I... Century Fox is like, guys, uh, we just earned three dollars off a of bicent. Is people still watching this? It's crazy. And I can't even imagine that they put him in like a robot. It's Robin Williams as a robot, but it doesn't even make any sense like that they would cover up Robin Williams because Robin Williams was like, of all people to put in a robot suit. And then nowadays, of course, they wouldn't even put anyone in a robot suit he would just, it would be a CGI or something. Yeah. This was 1999, but he insisted apparently from what I understand after my research of watching Bicentennial Man was that Robin really wanted to wear a suit, but you can't see any facial expressions or anything. And he can't, he has no movement really. And then towards the end of the movie, of course, he, I don't want to spoil. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, Danny spoiled, but don't, I don't say anything about what happens at the end of Titanic either. I want to say that for people. <laughs> Just spoiler alert. But we do see him in human sort of form by the end. And I was sobbing by the end, by the way. So I know I'm making fun of this movie, but the ending really made yes. me sob. Anyway, the point is, I think I do have just this, when I get stuck on something and when something gets in my head where I get stuck like that, it's like, that's all I want to talk about for at least a yeah. couple of days until I get out of my system. And then it's like, I can relieve myself. And I think in my podcast, that's helpful is like, yeah. I want, I need to talk about the end of this episode of Vanderpump Rules. I need to get off my chest. And then I'm able to get, just sort of release those, exercise those demons oh. and then move on with my life. A year and a half ago, I got re-obsessed with the 80s movie Mannequin with Andrew McCarthy and Kim Cattrall because as a kid, I remember just being obsessed as a little kid where I went and wrote the movie novelization on my little typewriter, like just by memory. And I was like, I was... I would literally go to like Dillard's in Kansas and like look at mannequins hoping they would fall in love with me. Like I was uh, really, like, yeah, it was yeah. an unhealthy obsession. And like the Starship song, nothing's going to stop us now. So like, but as a kid, you don't make the connection that this is complete fantasy and there's just no way that a mannequin will ever come alive. But that movie and Kim Cattrall, they sell such a ridiculous plot. Kim Cattrall commits so hard. Hollywood, one of the first gay representation men in film, Meshach Taylor from Designing Women, I went on such, I, I was obsessed with it for like two weeks, about a year and a half ago. And, and it was such a it. fun, it was such a fun rewind. And then Mannequin 2 on the move, uh, you know, different characters, but still, still great. These um, are the stories of our time, Ryan, and we need to keep I, them alive. I know. Yeah, <laughs> this is where they tell, pass these stories on through generations and generations. Uh, you know, I really think, I'm sorry to just put a button, <laughs> uh, we'll put a button on this, but yeah. I really think they need to do a gritty reboot of Bicentennial Man, or I think like a long a series. Gritty, like I, it has to be gritty. I, well, I think <laughs> I was watching it and I was like, this script, I think if you gave like a young auteur director the same exact script and I think they can make like a really fucking cool movie. It's oh, just yeah. there's sort of like so much weird clunkiness with the costuming and stuff. But I think like if you basically kind of you wouldn't have to rework that original script that much and you can make like a really fucking like an A24 got a hold of that. Oh God! Could you? And A twenty four actually did ex uh, Machina. Like they did. Yeah, like, uh, like so they, you could actually they, they do did a something companion. in that pain. Uh, Ryan. Well, okay. Speaking of AI, actually, uh, there's really no plan for this interview. You guys, this is just literally shooting the shed. I was, you know, some basics, but AI. Somebody up buttercups. Said, yeah. yeah <laughs> somebody up. sent me. Somebody sent me this, and I was like, I had the. You know, I was like, had a fever, so it was already weird. Somebody sent me. They keeps my buddy Sean keeps sending me AI clips of myself. That she's fed my podcast into an AI machine, and he sent me one. They're getting better than my actual podcast. Wait, so and it's, it's my your voice. voice. It's my voice. Like he'll put in my voice and be like, "Talk about Chris Jenner." 
This what? voice did a rap on Chris Jenner where I was so deluded. I was like, I don't even remember saying this. It was like, oh, it's AI. Like literally, so Ryan. Made that's why. That's why you actually earlier in this episode we're talking about how you didn't like video because you just want the AI yeah. audio yeah. to replace you. I think. I was like, my God, I need a break. Like, and what if that becomes like uh, just an amazing hit? And then Jax Taylor's like, I need AI. Damn it! Um, <laughs> doing AI podcast. That's scary. Uh, okay, so uh, well, actually, I do want to ask. You know, you've always been a proponent of home goods. No joke. Like you, oh, like, I, I, I remember four years ago, first starting this podcast, it was around uh, Christmas and it was like my first Christmas by myself. And I was like, God, I, it would be a dream to go holiday shopping with Danny Pellegrino. Like a lot of us have. How did that partnership come about? Because no joke, like it's got to be amazing when you get to advertising for a brand that you love. Yeah, no, I legitimately love home goods. I always have. It's like my relax. It's some. It's a place I go if I'm feeling crazed or something. Like I'll go and just sort of walk the aisles there. I, it's meditative for me almost. And I think a lot of home goods fans. If home goods has that sort of weird fan base thing that like the Bravo shows have yeah. in a weird way. There's like a home a weird uh, feeling about that. But I did some like influencery stuff for them because I think they had heard through the grapevine that I love them so much. And then uh, they had approached me about doing this thing where I go and basically interview people about what's in their carts. And so it was like the best day of my life. I got to go, we filmed them in New Jersey and it was a whole day. It was like, I don't know, was it 12 or 14 hours? It was like a long day in yeah. home goods and the store was closed. Uh, and they were, it was people who loved home goods. And basically they just brought them into the store and said, go, take this cart and a bunch of money and whatever you put in the cart, basically you can have. And Danny's going to come around and like interview you a little bit. So then I would just get to walk up to them and it was so incredibly creatively fulfilling because I have more of an improv improv background and they let me just go and improvise yeah. all of this stuff. And they had a couple little scripted things I had to read, you know, for disclosures and stuff. But otherwise it was just like me running around the store, getting to chat with people about what's in their cart. And it was the best day and spending the whole day in home goods, which was like pristinely organized because we were filming there. So everything was like so clean and I just had the best time. So I'm hoping they let me do more because it was, so I, I was just watching them. They're amazing. I mean, it's also like, like the Kardashians shutting down like a grocery store. Like it's like Danny Pellegrino getting to shut down a home goods and then literally get paid to ask people what are in, in their carts. You like, you would do that regardless. Like no, uh, you give yeah. you permission to actually have those conversations. I really want to do, do you remember back in the day, the Nickelodeon toy run or of course yes. supermarket oh. sweep is sort of similar. <laughs> I, I was like trying to tell them, I'm like, we have to do something like that where you give, because the home goods fans are everybody who goes to those, that store tends to really love it. Get some super fans of home goods and like give them five minutes and however many cartfuls they get, they get to take home with it. And then I was like, and maybe like just hire me there to like interview them at the end or something. Um, but I think that would be so fun to watch. Um, Do you remember I that, that. Uh, it was like mornings WGN, the Bozo, the clown show. And they would like, you would like do the, the flipping the, the ping pong balls into the bucket. And then yes. you would win for each bucket. And like, I was obsessed with that. I was like, I was so excited. I was like, that was the dream to be able to flip things. Cause each prize got bigger and bigger. If they could get like the ball into the furthest one. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. Um, and okay, there's something where creatively fun about just getting to be loose and silly and, I don't not have to adhere to sometimes when you do hosting things, there's so much you have to adhere to. Uh, so it's fun to just be able to let loose. We, we both studied and performed at groundlings, which I think different times, but can you speak to how important that training was for you uh, in what you do now? Yeah. I mean, I had spent so many years doing improv. I, before LA, I lived in Chicago and I studied at Second City there in the IO theater. And then uh, here, when I moved to LA, I studied at the Groundlings and got through that program and all that, those classes and stuff. And I think it just teaches you uh, how to go with, the, go with the flow, go with the moment. And I think, especially in podcasting, I take a lot of that improv skill that I had learned uh, from those places and I take it with me in, in terms of like how my brain is working during a recap. Like if I'm, if I go off on a little tangent and my brain thinks of something else, like I allow my brain to go with it. Whereas I think before I maybe knew some of the stuff about improv, I might've squashed that. I've been like, oh, that's not about reality TV. I'm not going there. And at least in my opinion, I think what people kind of come to my show for are those kind of tangents or detours. And so I think the improv helped me kind of uh, embrace that stuff. Yeah. It was like, oh, they always taught me like mistakes are a gift. You mm -hmm. know, is that like, we were always like, so like, oh, I did this wrong. It's like, no, doing something wrong and improv is actually this great gift you give yourself.
partner to actually be able to create a laugh out of something that is abnormal, to be able to notice that and not try to like smooth it out and make it nice, as Dorinda would say, which by the way, how much of a fever dream was that to wake up with one day uh, this week and Dorinda Medley's like, you know, I'm just sitting here thinking at a coffee shop, that was Danny Pellegrino. I miss him. I miss, uh, I miss our hangouts. I mean, what is that like? That is, I, I thought I, I was actually in a fever. So I was like, what is going on here? Yeah, that, Dorinda that, did post that. And I was the best. I, she was eating onion rings and she was like, oh, I'm missing Danny. And I love her. I love her. <laughs> we, I got to know her like kind of, uh, I had interviewed her while she was on Roni, but then after she had left Roni, I, her and I kind of became friendly. Uh, and I stayed at her house when my first book came out and she hosted me a, a little dinner there and I stayed in the fish room and yeah, she's really sweet and wonderful. And I, I don't know, she's also, Ita she's got like an Italian mother nature that I really respond to or, or sister Italian sistery relationship. She just reminds me of women in my family. And so I think that's, one of the things that I love about her, but yeah, she's, she's great. It just made me picture like you and her, like eating onion rings was like your thing. We do like, call, was, like we do talk on the phone sometimes and we haven't talked in a while, which is I think why she posted that. But uh, it is so fun because a lot of times she'll FaceTime me and it's just so weird because I'm like, oh, how am I FaceTiming with Dorinda? And she's like in <laughs> one of the, she's at Bluestone or something. And I'm looking at something or in the background like a christmas tree in the background i'm like oh my god how am i facetiming with dorinda and oh. she's got her christmas decor out like this is my dream some of it's bizarre. i had a phone conversation miss patricia from southern charm had me call her around the holidays and i thought i was being pranked and then she was like i was i was just listening and really you know i love i love your show all the time and i just you know and then we just started having this conversation then we started talking about moms and we started and it was so bizarre but i had to continually like like pinch myself to just stay in the conversation and not like disassociate that it was such a, cause I was like, this is crazy. This is, and she's completely normal. I'm sitting yeah. there trying to act like what I think a normal person would do in a phone call with her. And I think there's certain Bravo celebrities that you would, I don't know. Like I, yeah, I, I think Dorinda and Miss Pat, like they're a great level of Bravo celebrity where they they have a level of groundedness, maybe. Um, and I know yeah. people might disagree when it comes to Dorinda because on the show she always seems so crazy, but <laughs> I love her to death. Um, Wait, did you get in? Did you have a traitor's uh, fixation like I did? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And did I don't you, know. If, I don't know if she's. People are saying she's doing it now. I have not connected with her on the phone after that post, so I don't know that she is for sure or not because I want to ask her that. Is there a way you'd like to reveal on this podcast that you have blocked Dorinda from your phone? Well, no. The one thing I will say, though, is I thought they weren't – the thing that I heard on the street with a friend who was in talks to join the traders was that they weren't filming until, like, June or July. And so that's why I was a little confused why people were Was like, this friend oh. Tom Sandoval? No, no. I'm, jo I'm joking. No, no, June or July. Well, what I think it was was that uh, I think they were, like, doing pre-press. So yeah. I think they were doing some like interview footage, like before they actually go to the castle. But did you guys, cause that led me down the rabbit hole. Then I got into the uh, UK traders and Australian traders, which is so much, it's so much better in terms of gameplay than the American. Did you go that way too? I didn't go that my boyfriend, oh. Matt did, but I didn't. I, oh, Matt's I, dude. Did Matt like did it? The, I loved it. Yeah. He, I don't know which one he was it. I think he watched Australia. Maybe he watched one of the other ones. Uh, but I don't remember so which one. Can I tell you the best Miss Pat story that I don't know if I've yeah, told please. this ever on a podcast before? So I used to do this thing on my Instagram called Face Mask Friday where I would try different face masks. With the bed wine and stuff? Yeah, like I would try different stuff. Anyway, she had, um, I get this package in the mail and she sent me this big ass bottle of La Mer, which is like very expensive. What? I don't know if you know La Mer. I actually do. That's um, crazy. It's so expensive. And she sent me like a pretty big bottle of it. And with a note that basically said like, don't use those trashy moisturizers. <laughs> like, don't, like don't use that cheap shit. Basically was the, <laughs> was the note. And I just thought it was like the best thing ever. Like she, to be that, I don't know. It was also such a, like a, a Southern maternal thing of like, don't use that cheap shit. Like use this. I loved that's it. That's a, listen, I'm just going to just keep posting with shitty face masks for the rest of time now until that happens. That's I amazing. Hope she wouldn't get mad. Did you know what? She wouldn't get mad. <laughs> no, God, that, right? no, not at all. She like gets tickled about all of this stuff. Um, uh, So you just had Janet Elizabeth, our pal Janet Elizabeth on your podcast from the Valley. And uh, the thing that I, you know, I was one of those people that I, I did not hate on the Valley beforehand. I was like, I'm here. 
Like I'm, I'm seated. Like I don't like, I'm, I'm not one of those people that tries to, or I've learned not to shit on things before they've come out because I've made that mistake so many times. And it's one of the only times that I've been proven right, because I think this show hits on so many levels. I think it's hitting for you too, right? Yeah, I love it. I love it. I think it's so good. And I had heard things about it before as, as they were filming and it got me more excited because I think naturally all of us thought, oh, they're doing a Valley show about parenting. Like that's going to be boring. Who or wants something. that? Yeah. And then when I started to hear some like the stuff leaking about behind the scenes, I was like, oh fuck, like they're going to be messy and this might be even messier than Vanderpump rules. And so I love it. And I do want to say, now that we're talking about this, because I don't know if I'll get a chance to talk about this on my show, but I want to talk about the delay in filming because I for Vanderpump Rules, because I think my theory is that it's because the Valley launch was so successful, they don't need to have a double night for programming. They can launch, and they all have been having trouble launching new shows on Bravo. So now I think they'll take the Valley and put it in the launching spot that Vanderpump rules is normally in. And they'll be able to use the Valley <laughs> to launch a new show. Exactly. And then a few months later, they'll be able to use Vanderpump rules to launch a new show, whether that be a spinoff or just some other random show. Yeah. It's really hard to explain to the audience. I keep trying to explain why this is such a smart move. And I also think it's a smart move where we got the official announcement that the Valley is not going to have a reunion. And I think a lot of things like two things can be true at once. Like, the Valley, I think, doesn't need a reunion. In fact, it's like would make it a more tenuous situation because they're going to pick back up cameras way earlier than they thought to fill that Vanderpump Rules space. They're going to film over the summer where Vanderpump Rules usually would. And to Danny's point, he's completely correct. You know, Vanderpump Rules really launched the Valley. They're getting like a 0.7 in the ratings, which is really good. It held on to most of the key, like every key demographic that you want. But now it can actually have legs and go on its own. You risk with the reunion them completely exploding their relationships because because everything is potentially hanging by a thread. You got Dodie, Janet, Jax, Brittany, whatever's going on with them. Why not just pick back up the cameras like they're doing? Don't do the reunion because it could ruin so many relationships before they start filming a second season or even kind of make them completely dead and buried. And Vanderpump, yes, they do need that time to go mm -hmm. live life. Like I, I'm and I want them to go a step further and put a kibosh on some of the podcasts, not ours, but like them talking about each other on the podcast. <laughs> not, never ours. <laughs> no, no, no. Guys, I want to be, uh, I'm never. taking it back. Taking never it back. ours. Um, no, it's like, you know, it's like, I, I want that too. Like, I want to actually have a break. I want to have a see and, you know, have a bitch in summer. Let's all like regroup. We've got Jersey coming up, which is already a mess in terms of social media. Like, let's, let's go love other things for a minute and let the Vanderpumpers figure out what's going on with their lives. I did hear, and we're recording this in early May, so maybe this will come out when this airs, but I did hear that they are doing a reunion, but it's like one of the, uh, watch what happens. So it's not like a official reunion. It's like a watch what happens <laughs> live reunion. I've heard that, but then I've heard certain people are not going to participate in it. Oh, well, like, I don't, I hate those watch what happens live reunions and they need to it just does. It feels, it feels so claustrophobic. <laughs> it feels claustrophobic. Stressful, claustrophobic. Well, the worst are the below, the below deck zoom ones because no, they're I all can't. overseas. I, it's very hard. We to have watch. to stop that. And I, if just give us a full studio, it can't be that much to rent out a studio space. That's a little bit bigger to do a full reunion, but the uh, watch Tom Sandoval, live, Tom Sandoval rents out a football stadium to rehearse with his band. You don't think they can shoot there. Right. Right. And it just, it makes me like the shows less. I don't know if I could explain that exactly, but it makes me think that those are like the D-list properties and we don't have to like them as much. They could come and go. They might get canceled, might not. You know, I just feel like those are the D-list uh, yeah. reality shows that are getting those. And they're claustrophobic. They're hard to follow. They're they're frustrating to watch. They're just th terrible in every way. And I know they're trying their best and we love Watch What Happens Live and all the people there, but uh, they need to do something different. Why Stuck choose out. face mask? Why <laughs> choose face mask? Cheap face mask when you can use La Mer. You know, like we got right. it. We have the La Mer of cheap shit. Yes, Loosen exactly. The purse strings, and especially with something like the Valley, I'm like, well, they're getting really good ratings. Like, why would they not have a studio reunion? I, I, I'm I, very except for the I, except for what you said about uh, starting filming. I think that part makes sense.
Yeah. Well, um, my don't idea was do the like, Watch What Happens Live reunion. Well, we don't Danny, want wouldn't it be excited if they started filming and then the third or fourth episode was them gearing up to shoot the reunion? So like really do it meta. Mm, like then actually have that. the reunion as part of the second season. We haven't seen that before, but there is like the Valley is like having that Beverly Hills 90210 moment. If you guys remember back in the 90s, like this show all of a sudden exploded between seasons. So they brought it back in the summer. They brought it back. They made them filming. Brandon worked at the beach club. Everything was like, and the Valley, Valley, nobody expected it to do as well as it did. So, and isn't it so funny? Life is so weird that after all this time, Jax Taylor finally got his wish. He's back on TV. Mm, all it took it. was having to completely explode his life. And I truly don't think he cares that he exploded his life. I truly, this is the fascination of Jax is that I truly think he's letting the show do his dirty work for him in certain ways. Are you watching the after show for Vanderpump Rules yeah, where they're of kind of mixing? I think it's so fantastic. But also <laughs> whenever they cut to the interviews of like Tom, Tom and Jax, the three of them together, there is some sort of like weird, I hate to say midlife crisis, but it does feel a little bit like they're going through a midlife crisis and they're all getting out of these relationships. And I don't know, there's something that's, makes me feel very uneasy about the three of them together again. And now they're single and they're back on TV and the shows are popular. There is something very dark sided about that. And I just had to shut that out. I mean, I always used to joke when I would write fan fiction of Vanderpump rules about the three of them eventually having to live at Tom Sandoval's old shitty apartment again. But I never thought that we would actually get to that place where it's a conversation. Like I always thought and like, it feels I, I possible. Yes, it feels possible. Like I used to, I had this one bit where it was like somebody was going to leave a baby, like in three men and a baby on Sir's doorstep. And it was going to be a note of like, Jax, I met you in Vegas. This is your son. I can't take care of him anymore. And then those three doof doofuses have to raise a child, like in three men and a baby. And now I feel like that we're just like moments away from something like that happening. But at the same time, it's so viewable with the Valley and it doesn't have the bad feelings associated where when I watch Vanderpump Rules, it takes me down emotionally each week because I I get so sad. And I, do you feel that way about Vanderpump sometimes this season? Um, you know, I don't like when um, the Vanderpump fan base has been tough this season, I think. It just feels um, everyone's got very strong feelings about the show, which is great. But it almost it reminds me of seasons like the Bethany and Carol season of Roni or or when we when I cover uh, New Jersey on my show, it always feels like the the Teresa and the Melissa, and that's how I feel with Vanderpump <laughs> lately. Where it just it kind of sucks a lot of the fun out of recapping because we're just here to take the piss out of the show and like have some yeah. laughs and you know whatever. And so I think there's been times where it feels almost impossible, even with Ariana, who we love. I love her, and I just saw her recently, and I was like, oh my god. Uh, I, I'm worried that people are saying that I'm saying all this shit. And all I said was like, your room is messy, you know, kind of oh, thing. I know. But it's like you, if you say anything, I was getting so many messages one week when I said, was talking about her, the takeout. And I understand people wanting to defend her, but also we're just having some fun talking about takeout. Like it's not. And also Ariana would understand too. Ariana yeah, jokes she's about got herself. A, right. She's got, that's the other frustrating part is like, no, and she's got a great sense of humor and all of these things. And I, I know, I know her and yes. you know, so it's Ariana was living in a bunker fallout situation. You could tell this person did not want to leave that room. So everything was done within that space of that. And that to me is hysterical that each episode, the boxes got higher and higher. Or even with Sheena too, on, on the flip side of the coin, it's like, sometimes I'll say something maybe in defense of Sheena and it's silly and funny. And like, but you know, people feel so strong, like how dare you support Sheena or something. And it's like, Look, Dude, I, it's Sheena. It's Sheena's just like iconic, a silly reality show. And this is a show about waiters. Like we're having some fun and it does change the week to week. So like, just because I'm saying that I agreed with Sheena in this moment, next week I might hate her or, you know, it flips. And that's the whole point of these shows is to take us on that roller coaster. And so we're supposed to feel that way. Uh, but so I, that's where I've had trouble with Vanderpump Rules. It's like, I, I just want to have fun and make people laugh. Like I'm not trying to get in the, in the, and that's why I think that's it. why, that's why they need the break. They need the break so we can all get back to a place of like letting this show find out what it's going to be moving forward. And it doesn't like, listen, I'm upset about Lala running her mouth uh, the, and, and saying negative things about Ariana. Of course I am. And I say that every show. But at the same time, let's see where I, I'm also a big fan of. Let's see yeah. what the producers, what story they're trying to tell. And then we can figure out because they're trying to tell us a story. What is it?
And by the way, too, as a recapper who's doing it every single week, sometimes you're like, okay, I've I've already said how much every single week. I feel like I'm saying I love Ariana so much, and I, you know, so I can't say that every single second on my show. And so sometimes you have to just go into other things. But then at the same time, there's people that get mad. They'll say, oh, you're defending Ariana too much. I know. I know. Like, so you, you can really never can't win. But but I just feel like the fever pitch of Vanderpump Rules fandom is so so much so that it. It like people feel so strongly about these situations. And so I do think there is a break because if if kind of we're feeling this way, which is so tangential to what, yeah. what they must be feeling. Um, yeah. So I can only imagine what it's like for all those people. But um, I've, yeah. I've never experienced something like that with reality television before where it was the fever pitch. And I mean, I was so into it. I mean, it was, I mean, it was a weird time in my life anyways, dealing with my mom, but it was like on top of that. And every day something new was coming out and that's even, you know, even to this day, Rachel has a response podcast after every, right. It like goes down deep, this rabbit hole. We have lawsuits still. It's, I've just never seen this. And I think the, you know, evolution and all the cast has handled this as best they can but it's really interesting to see a show that potentially was going to die off two seasons ago have a resurgence the way that it has where the cast is even taken off guard. And now they're like, which brand deals am I supposed to get? Like, it's a very weird thing to watch. And I think that's what's happening with Sheena and Lala on the show. Um, or, or Sheena, I should say, on Vanderpump Rules. is I think she's struggling the most with like the audience perception versus her perception. And you can see yeah. that internal struggle with her of like, you know, she wants to please everyone, but ultimately when you want to please everyone, you're going to please no one. And so you can tell it tears her apart. Like, it, in her mind, like, like, like people like, you, like yeah. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, like yeah. she really is like telling the truth when she says like, I see these things and then I'm picturing Brock with Lala. And then I get the audience. Say, like she j legitimately does. Like she lives in that where the one thing other that people I, don't. Yeah. The one thing though, that which she, you know, I do think she has got a pure heart, but I just don't quite understand her allegiance to Tom. I don't know. It seems like it, yes, no, he did, did some did things, but it, but if he did really awful things to your good friend, I think you should not be friends with them. My theory but, uh, is that Sheena is one of those people that like she wants to be loved. She wants to be told that she's special, like a lot of us do. Tom actually like Tom now is saying like you mean so much to me, dude. You always oh, yeah, have. Man. And uh, then Sheena and then Sheena like thinks back to the first time when he was nice to her at the press tour, and she's like, oh maybe he has loved me this intensely all time. Like he has been the one behind my back when Stassi was making fun of me. Like you, know, I feel like she really has those things, and it like hits that pleasure button of somebody saying that she is special and unique. She's special and unique regardless of who thinks it. But it is interesting. I think. And I don't know if Tom, um, that's a master plan or if he's just naturally saying this, but it does play into what we know, Sheena as a character, what she gets off on in a sense. Right, right. Um, I don't know. So, I just think Tom has done such awful things that, I don't know. I, well, could you believe like Short really saying that he was going to move in with like, uh, I decided, yeah, let's give it a shot. Like, what are you, thank God I watched the yeah. after show and they kind of like, she was like, I don't think it's going to happen. Like, why would you ever, if you are ever trying to put your best foot forward at anything, go, yeah, I think we should live together. Like what? It seems very much like the guys are in this arrested development and I don't know how they get out, when they get out, but it does feel like they're just uh, Oh, they're in the clean development and they're in the hell of their own making. Even like we talked about Jackson, it's like, he's back on TV, but at what cost? It's like, he's back in this hell that I don't know. It's like, no, yeah, it's well, the you're weirdest, losing it's your the family. Thing. And to watch you Sweet, Britney. Anyway, maybe, but. Sweet Britney seems like, I mean, she seems like she's excited to be back too, but it's the weirdest thing to watch them do press together or go to the correspondence dinner. And she's putting on this brave smiling face. I'm like, I've been through breakups and divorce and all that. It's, I don't think we would have ever been able to do a press line. I don't think we would have ever been able to. It, it's so bizarre. And only a handful of people will probably ever be able to experience what they're going through. But it makes it, it adds to this not real. And I know it's real, but it adds to this, like, what is going on over there? Yeah, I know. I'm curious where they'll go next season. If if they'll, it seems like they're for sure getting a divorce. Like, it seems like everyone's saying like, yeah, they won't get back together. How would, how would you, how and why would you want it? Like, and if anything, it's a parting gift is like a, a career. The parting gift is we're back on TV. Enjoy it. You know, Brittany got to hang out with Stassi the other day for the first time and ever. Katie said something nice about her, you know? Do you, let me ask you this. Do you think Brittany has a career in television? Uh, post Jack's. 
Or do you think she even wants one? Maybe she doesn't want one. I think she I think she wants one. I think that's something yeah. that seems like she gets very excited about. I don't mean that in a negative way. It just seems like a lot of them, like this was their dream in a weird way. And especially if you grow up in Kentucky, a small town, like this is this is the the top of the mountain in a lot of ways to be on a reality show. So I think she des desperately wants it. I don't know. Like it depends on the success of the Valley and if she can get more, you know, sponsorships like Jenny Craig. I, I don't know. I don't know where a lot of these people go. The only one that I was super excited about was Ariana. Cause I was like, make doing Broadway, doing a hosting gig. Those are great things to have in your tool belt for whenever Vanderpump rules does end. That's great, man. To show you know, that you're I a Broadway pull. I sort of want her to like secretly leave the show. Uh, Vanderpump yeah. rules just cause I think she could really thrive. And I feel this way about Paige on summer house too. I think, Paige is great on Summer House, but I think if she did a power move and left, and if Ariana, obviously Ariana has more sort of power outside of the Bravo sphere, but I think there is sort of this powerful thing about leaving on your own accord. And Ariana, I really think would like just thrive and not have to deal with seeing that demon. Um, so Be I, because yeah, I by the way, and I'll, I'll, I say this till I'm blue in the face, Ariana told us exactly what she was going to do even before the season started. So the fact that she even is around him, I think is a triumph in a lot of ways. Production thought they were probably going to be able to get scenes. They didn't, but she told like, we can't get mad at somebody that actually has a way that they want to live their white uh, life. And I love, I love gray rocking. I love, uh, you know, shut you got to shut people out that really do not serve, serve you well. She's stronger than most people that I know. Um, yeah. I think her and Katie just do the show differently than the others. Like Katie and her, I feel live by this is my life. And so the cameras can follow that. Uh, this is how I'm going to be reacting to these people. This is how I'm going to be friends with this person or not be friends with this person. And if you guys want to follow it, great. That's my reality. Whereas I think maybe Sheena and Lala and some of the others will, uh, are, more cognizant of like, oh, I have to go film this scene or I have to go do this scene. And or I have I to bring that, it. I have to bring it. And I don't know that either of them are wrong or right. Like, I don't know what the answer is. It just feels like they're, they're acting within this show in different ways. They're in this ecosystem or moving through the ecosystem in different ways. And I think that is causing so much conflict between them. Um, but I don't know. Yeah. Sometimes I think like, sometimes I, I <laughs> go back and forth with my own head. I'm like, sometimes I think, okay, you're doing a reality show. So yes, you, we, we need these scenes of everybody interacting. And then other times I'm like, yeah, why the fuck would Ariana want to Well, that's talk to the that big person? fallacy of like Schwartz keep going the gang. We've got to get the gang back together. Like guys, this isn't a gang. And it's like, I mean, it's like, I mean, a literal like legitimate gang that like hates each other against another <laughs> gang, but these aren't friends. Like these are not like, don't out there go expect this from your friend group because that wouldn't be a friend group. These are coworkers. These are coworkers that have experienced trauma and history together and there's good feelings a lot of the times but like how would ariana ever trust lala again with any personal information no offense to lala i think lala as a sane person would go like yeah why would this person ever try to say anything to me again in a personal manner after this stuff i've said about her and if they were more friends than co-workers if they were more friends than co-workers i think they would have had ariana's back more and instead phased Tom or at, maybe both Toms, but at least Tom Sandoval out of the show. Cause they all would have bandied together and be like, well, we're not Sisterhood of the traveling this. pants. Right. And you so know? then we would have had this one awkward season that might not have been great, but they would have been icing out Tom Sandoval. And then maybe the show would have been like, okay, we, we don't need Tom anymore because he doesn't have a relationship with anyone. Much like something like uh, early in the Beverly Hills with Brandy Glanville, Andy Cohen used to always say, if, if you're on an island alone, you don't have a relationship with these people. And I think that's where the show could have went. And if, if these people were maybe closer friends, like if Lala was a closer friend to Ariana or Sheena, I, I don't know. Sheena's an yeah. interesting case, but I, I think they could have, that's where the season could have went. I know. And It'll I kind of wish that. Season. I sort of, the lost I, season I kind of wish that. Get. I know. I sort I, of wish that. That's why AI, AI, we can do it, Danny. Uh, here's the thing that pisses me off is like with the guys now, they're going to get, they kind of got the redemption arc already. Okay. Especially uh, Schwartz is always get redeemed. Schwartz is golden. <laughs> Schwartz is golden regardless He's of always what he does. Yeah. But we've seen that Ariana is cool with Schwartz. You know, she's kind of fine with him. And so he's, uh, him and Tom now are on pretty strong footing going into the next season. And it's like, I feel like Katie and Ariana are the ones on less strong footing. And that's frustrating because I'm so like, weird. it should be the opposite way. Like, how did this happen? It's so, so weird. I know I got to let you go here, but I just wanted to say we got the summer house seating chart. They're filming the reunion as we speak today. 
and Lindsay and Carl are on both sides of Andy. I just talked to Lindsay yesterday on the show, which was a very nice, I mean, it was very nice for her to do because she didn't have to. Um, but it, just really did quickly, you leave, that, did you leave it feel, feeling more on her side or Carl's side or how did you leave that? I felt, I just left feeling bad. Like she seems very, uh, I mean, obviously very Lindsay, but very, and it was like the, you know, yesterday, the day before the reunion and you could just tell she was upset. You could just tell she was upset. And we, I, I've seen this week's episode, obviously, but I haven't seen the rest of the season. I feel it. And I guess I hear it gets way worse, obviously between them. And it just made me sad because, you know, from her perspective, she wasn't trying to sell me a bill of goods of like this, but it is just interesting. I'm all for Carl's sobriety journey. I think that's just so inspirational for so many, but it is, and uh, you know, he did a lot of things wrong in that relationship, I think, because yeah. Lindsay, for better or worse, you might not like the package that she presents, but it's always been who she is. And Carl knew that, you know, so yeah. to go around having all of these scenes with other people including his family, it could really, that was so fucked up to it, me. It could rock you as a person. It could rock yeah. you. Like that's the, and I think that seems like the overwhelming sadness. And I think I have to cut all this out of her interview with the parents, you know, his parents, cause she just seems really hurt about that in particular uh, because she, you know, she's like, I, I had a relationship they, with Sharon before. Yeah. yeah. The Bravo rep was like, I, I got so much good stuff. Yeah. I was but, I allowed know. to say this. I don't know if you're going to cut this out, yeah. but isn't that the most frustrating when you get something really, really good. And then, you're asked to cut it and then sometimes well, it's like when do i get to be the show that gets the real good thing that you don't mm -hmm. have to cut like when I do i get something recently ryan that would have shocked and it was frustrating and i'm not saying it was uh, anyway it might not yeah. have been a bravo thing yeah of course no it's all it, but I, I'm i do not other interviews but I'm it's so frustrating when you're asked I'm, to I'm thankful for the opportunities and Lindsay, like Lindsay's there wanting to tell the whole story. Like Lindsay would have given me two hours. I had to get to like three, 30 minutes. And then it was like, then I'm cutting these sections out and, and uh, I, you know, I'm not, I understand how it works, but sometimes I'm like, Oh man, take the risk. Like, let it be out there. Let it, I think it's good, but who knows? I know. I know. And then also when you hear from people who are like, I can't believe you didn't ask that question. Yes, I want to be I like, know. I did ask that question, but I was be, trying to be polite or, or, you know, they asked to cut it. So uh, yeah. Anyway, anyways. But I, yeah, I think the summer house stuff is so interesting because it, it took us on that roller coaster. So it's been really fun to watch it play out no matter whose side you're on. I think week to week, it was, it's been sort of flipping in certain ways. Like at the beginning of the season, I was so against Lindsay and yeah. trying to out his sobriety. And, and I, then you kind of see more a little her... bit more her side. And yes, now I kind of feel like they're both maybe terrible and it's just a good thing in general that they, well, yeah, that they obviously don't belong with each other. That's the big takeaway, but it is interesting. And co you know, like I've been, and Carl hurt, plays I've hurt the victim more. Yeah. Carl he does, plays but I think up. And yes, I think he does, but I don't even know if he's aware of doing it because I still think he's trying to find out who he is without drugs and alcohol. He's building his personality again. And it's something that obviously he needed to actually feel comfortable was drugs and alcohol with himself. So I think when you're that person, you're looking at everything as a deposition. Do you're you looking think at everything. Do you think the cast is going to change for next season of Summer House? I get worried they'll probably get rid of Gabby. I get worried that, uh, but I don't think it's going to change much. I, I really don't. I think they'll, I think they'll put Lindsay back in. I think they'll put Carl back in. I think, you know, and we'll see who has the hot potato. Like I get Anna and Kyle, obviously West and Jesse were good for season additions. Uh, I, I'm curious. What, what do you think? Yeah. The, I think Gabby, you're right. Just hasn't been on screen much. And so that yeah. leads me to believe that, you know, she hasn't really had a huge overarching storyline throughout the season. And obviously some of the stuff got eaten up because the Carl Lindsay has been taking up so much space, but it just seems from a screen time. It's like, well, I don't really know much about Gabby. And um, so unless maybe later in the season, she gets more in the mix and obviously she's an ally for Lindsay, but to me, it never feels like I'm like, when did they develop such a close relationship? Like I, I almost think like, and um, maybe they did and I, it was off screen or something, but I sometimes think like they do need someone for Lindsay. Um, that ha she has a stronger relationship if we're going to bring Lindsay back. Or even if we yeah. bring Gabby back too, maybe we need another Lindsay ally if she's going to be able to survive because it, it feels like at least people are going to take Carl's side in the cast. Well, I don't know or about that because Pay. I think you might be able, I think I. it seems like Paige especially might be a little more understanding of Lindsay than anybody 
thinks or that seems to be where it's potentially headed and it is interesting as the season goes on how like you said people have changed their opinions of where they started with Lindsay to where they are now but it is at the end of the day it's so funny because we all have like such weird relationship issues in our life at times so it's like I think that's the thing as I get older because I get into it but I'm like yeah why are we like it's like the sides like team this team yeah, that yeah. it's like we're all miserable at some point and it's like how do we get through this because we make so many mistakes but it is these sometimes are our really sports, horrible Ryan. The, these, these are, are our sports, sports. We have everyone has a story sometimes. as you always right. say uh, as Kathy Lee Gifford says Danny Pellegrino you've done it once again I know I've taken up so much of your time I wish I could go on for hours and hours with you uh, but like I, you know Danny isn't promoting anything but you can go everything iconic with Danny Pellegrino I'm telling you, go get those books. If you yes, haven't, get, those books. get the audio books too. I'm telling you, like I have both and it really is just one of those comforting things that I am now adding to a yearly rotation. Uh, go <laughs> check out his, uh, his new puppet character that I think is brilliant. <laughs> go check out home goods and Good what guy. else? Wait, what are you, what are you binging this weekend? Anything? Oh my God. I'm excited to watch that new Anne Hathaway movie. I also got, uh, I don't know if I'm, I guess this is fine. No, I got screeners of that new Jake Gyllenhaal movie or TV show on Apple. It's like, um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god, I started watching it last night. It's so good. So, um, and Hacks is out. There's like a Hacks lot of season good three. Stuff. Yeah, Selling the OC season three is out Selling or season the four. Uh, there's a lot to catch up. And you uh, reminded me to watch my uh, my life on the D list is and on Peacock with Kathy Griffin. Bicentennial man's available to buy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you bicentennial head! You By the way, the, the Reddit threads like Bicent he's talking bicentennial. Finally, finally. At least when I watch, it, you could not stream <laughs> it. You had uh, to purchase it for full price, and so that's when it, it was, meant something. You might have to pay eighteen dollars to watch Bicentennial Man in the year twenty twenty four, or go buy a, a used DVD somewhere. But you know, maybe do it. Maybe do it, you guys. That's the summation of this entire podcast. I will talk to you Thank guys you, next Ryan. time. Thank you, Danny. I love you. Bye. Did you try? I need to keep this open.